Hey everybody, welcome to today's live stream. I'm Jason Rodriguez. If you don't know me, I'm the community and product evangelist at Litmus, uh, which is a software platform for email marketers that helps you to build, test, analyze, send better email campaigns, all that good stuff. Uh, if you're not familiar, just go over to litmus.com to check out the product. Uh, but more importantly, I am by trade a designer, a coder, uh, somebody that's been working with email for a long time, someone who loves design, loves code, all that good stuff, um, and someone who cares about accessibility uh, for a variety of reasons. And today's live stream is going to be all about email accessibility, particularly from the code standpoint and the design standpoint. Um, so we'll be talking through why accessibility matters in email marketing and email design, how to create more accessible emails, how to code accessible emails, all that good stuff. Um, this is going to be building on the other email that I have been building throughout the last, I think, what, three or four live streams this year uh, that was building out this receipt email. We'll look at that code a little bit more. Uh, not so much live coding as kind of walking through that code, figure out how we can make that email accessible or how it's kind of built to be accessible by default. And really looking forward to answering people's questions about accessibility. Um, it's a topic I've been thinking about, writing about for a couple of years now, uh, doing more research into. By no means do I know everything about accessibility. I don't think anybody does. Uh, there are people far more tapped into the accessibility world than I am. Um, but I, I like to think that I know a lot. And if I don't <laughs> have answers to questions, then I usually know where to point you to find out those answers. Um, so hopefully this can be kind of a good session to learn together. Um, so I'm going to flip over to my screen here. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, if you have questions, then use the chat inside of YouTube that you should see to ask them. I'm keeping an eye on that. Hello, really good emails, folks. I don't know if that's Matthew, Matt, Mike, whoever <laughs> that happens to be, but, but glad you're here. Um, see a couple of other people watching as well. Uh, but yeah, let's let's dig into accessibility when it comes to email marketing and email design and development. Um, so I guess we'll, I'm going to kind of gloss over this email for a second and talk a little bit about the importance of creating accessible emails um, because it is absolutely important to create accessible emails and something that a lot of people in the industry still don't really know that much about or why they should care about accessibility. Um, so I'm going to be referencing something throughout this live stream. It's this ultimate guide to email accessibility that Lemus put out, um, authored by myself based on you know research over the years, help from folks like Jaina Mystery and Alice Lee and Mark Robbins and all, all those super smart people that have been thinking about this stuff for a long time as well. Um, if you don't have a copy, then you can go grab it for free. I'm going to put the link in the chat here. Um, but yeah, this is an ebook that we published that is, you know, 34 pages on <laughs> email accessibility. That's all it's talking about. Um, it goes over, you know, why accessibility is important, how to design, write accessible emails, um, how to actually code and implement those emails so that the widest range of users can interact with them, all that good stuff. Um, but first, I kind of want to just go over, you know, a couple of stats that I usually bring up in talks and workshops, stuff like that. Um, I These are a little bit old, too. So if anything, I think these numbers have likely increased. And I'd love to hear if anybody else has, um, you know, resources that I should be looking at, other stats, other reports, that kind of stuff. Uh, but a big one is I, a lot of times when we talk about accessibility, a lot of people think about visual impairments as one of the biggest uh, categories of disability. And that's anything from full on blindness to, you know, different degenerative disorders of the eye. Um, you know, even just having to wear glasses is a visual impairment, a visual disability that a lot of people have to deal with. Um, and that plays a big role into how we think about accessible email design and how do we actually build our email campaigns. But the World Health Organization, I forget which year for this stat is from, but uh, estimated there's around 1.3 billion people with visual impairments. Uh, that's billion with a B, not an M, which is a huge number to think about. Um, 
when it comes to, like color blindness, then one in twelve men uh, it usually affects. Uh, men more than women uh, so about eight percent of men happen to be colorblind which can uh, impact our design choices especially when it comes to, like ctas and contrast and stuff like that 0.5 uh, percent of women uh, one in 200 tend to be colorblind and there's different types of colorblindness too um, which we can talk about a little bit more as well all uh, right 15 percent of people are estimated to be dyslexic uh, that's a huge thing when it comes to actually writing copy for our emails and you know we'll talk a little bit about how simple copy uh, is a good thing to strive for so that as many people as possible can can understand that email um, cognitive disabilities affect 4.8 percent of people and again that can be a wide range of things uh, but definitely impacts again how we write and kind of strategize our email campaigns how we actually code and develop those emails as well uh, it, one of the big things that I, I, I've seen more people talking about is the fact that the world's population is aging. There is a huge number of people that are in older generations. Um, you know, we think about the baby boomers, that whole boom post-war. Uh, that generation is getting older, and they're more and more having to deal with disabilities like visual impairments, um, you know, motor disabilities with how they actually like interact with devices and physically use those devices. Uh, and that's just going to keep on going as that generation continues to age, as we all continue to age. Um, I do have glasses that I wear occasionally because I'm getting older. My sight's not getting any better, uh, like most people's. So these are all things we have to kind of contend with. Um, but on top of just like the goodwill of doing right by your subscribers, uh, a lot of industries have to factor in actual legislation and laws that will impact uh how they actually build and design email campaigns. So uh, big one, 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act um, kind of introduced some of that legislation in the U.S. Uh, there's the Equality Act of 2010. Um, there's this whole s section of code called Section 508 um, that dictates a lot of what we need to consider for accessibility when we're building digital products. Uh, there's the web content accessibility guidelines aren't legislation by any stretch, uh, but they are good guidelines that those other pieces of legislation uh, kind of reference, and they're just good practices to understand how to build accessible experiences. Uh, it's definitely geared towards the web side of things, web design, web development, but since we're using the same technologies, we're using HTML and CSS, um, a lot of those practices, those best practices, absolutely apply for email. Um, if, you know, your boss is, I, I, I've talked to a lot of people over the years and at conferences and, you know, in chat rooms and stuff like that, where they care about accessibility, but their bosses might not, or, you know, it's, it's like a time crunch thing, a resources thing where they just don't prioritize accessibility. And, um, you know, that's, <laughs> that, that has real business implications. So if you are dealing with a stakeholder, that doesn't seem to care about accessibility or doesn't want you to focus on making accessible email experiences. Um, a great stat is this uh, this group put out a study that uh, estimated that the world's disabled population controls over one trillion dollars in disposable income. I feel kind of like Dr. Evil saying that uh, one trillion in annual disposable income. Um, so that's a huge amount of money, potential money that companies are leaving on the table because they build experiences online, uh, in email and in people's inboxes that are inaccessible and people that have those disabilities, uh, can't interact with your emails. They can't interact with your web pages. It creates a lot of friction, a lot of frustration. Um, so they're not going to do business with you. And why would they if you don't care about their needs and uh, you know how they actually interact with your product and your email campaigns? Um, so I, I think that's such a great stat to bring up to anybody that's like, oh, you know, it's we don't have to worry about accessibility. Um, you know, we can focus on other things and spend our time elsewhere. Uh, but just use those kind of stats. There, there's a bunch of studies out there, too. If anybody knows any other ones, drop them in the chat. I'd love to see them. Uh, lots of resources out there. Um, but one of the things that I always bring up when we talk about accessibility is this awesome toolkit that Microsoft, the design team over there, put together. Um, it's their inclusive design toolkit. 
Uh, that goes into a lot of different things around accessibility, around diversity and inclusion when we're designing digital products. Um, but they have this great, I think it will trigger a PDF download. I don't know if this, let's see what happens here. Yeah. Um, this great graphic, there's this downloadable kind of guide, um, this manual to inclusive design. Uh, but this great graphic here that I've used in plenty of presentations uh, that has all these different icons of people uh, with different disabilities. And it kind of speaks to this idea of a spectrum of abilities that people experience throughout their lifetimes. Um, so far too often when we think about people with a disability, we think of people with permanent disabilities, uh, like they might be blind, um, they might not have hands or arms, they might be um, you know, wheelchair bound, whatever that happens to be. But what a lot of us don't realize on a daily basis that there is a wide spectrum of disabilities that a lot of us will, will all essentially experience some sort of disability at some point in our lives, whether or not it's permanent. Um, so there are temporary disabilities that we should be designing for as well, because we're, we're going to be affected by those things. Um, you know, you might have just gone to the eye doctor and had an eye exam where they dilated your pupils and your vision is all screwy because of that. Um, you might have broken your arm so that you can't interact with your device or your mouse as easily as you normally would. Uh, you might be, you know, holding your newborn child, something like that, where again, you can't interact with your device, your emails easily as you normally would. Uh, as we get older, we have, a lot of us will start wearing glasses, our, our eyesight will start going. It's, it's this wide range of disabilities that people are constantly dealing with. Um, and I think that's a really important point to keep in mind is that it's not just like the big permanent buckets of disabilities that, that we should worry about when we think about accessibility. It's everybody uh, because we're all going to be experiencing some of those disabilities throughout our lifetime. Might not be permanent, might be temporary, uh, but really when you're building more accessible emails, then you are absolutely helping everybody out that uses that email. Um, you know, even if you're you have a really great site, if there's high contrast in that email, it's going to be really easy to read, especially if you have a dimmer screen, you're trying to save battery life, or you're in bright sunlight. Those higher contrast emails will be easier for people with the best vision to read. Um, if you're making your buttons nice and big so that people that have motor disabilities can still interact with them, people without those motor disabilities will be able to interact with that email a lot easier than normal. Um, so when we think about accessibility, when we think about creating accessible designs, accessible emails, uh, it's absolutely worth investing in because not only are you helping out, uh, you know, those kind of what most people think of as like traditionally disabled communities, you're helping out everybody. Uh, you're making your experience easier to interact with, um, easier to read, easier to consume, easier for people to convert from a business standpoint. Uh, so there's a lot of great benefits for thinking about accessibility. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't in the email world for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, I, I feel like it's only in the last, like, five, six years or so there have been more resources out there uh, for people to learn about accessibility, to ramp up their own accessible uh, accessibility skills, and figure out how to design those experiences. Um, it is kind of cool to see that 77% of brands that we survey during our annual state of email survey, our big survey that, that we do every year, uh, they do say that email accessibility is a priority. Um, but only 8% of those brands rigidly follow best practices for email accessibility. So I think that kind of <laughs> speaks volumes. It's one of those things like, you know, people say they prioritize one thing, but where are they actually spending their time and money? And a lot of people aren't spending their time and money on accessibility and email. Um, but there's a whole bunch of things we can do to create more accessible experiences. Um, this guide, again, the ultimate guide to email accessibility is a great way to dig into some of these topics. It goes through, you know, what are assistive technologies? What are the different technologies people are using to interact with our emails? Um, it goes into, you know, copywriting issues, visual design issues, all that kind of stuff to make the visual appearance of your emails more accessible. Uh, and then it goes into the code side of things, which is largely what we're going to be talking about today um, and focusing on during this live stream. Um, so let me pop back over to this email. Um, this is something if, if you've joined before in the live streams, you have seen this email. Uh, last time around, we enabled dark mode uh, on this email to make it work better in 
you know, those dark mode email clients like Apple Mail dark mode. So we have a great looking email uh, for dark mode. Um, but we're going to be looking at this again and seeing how uh, this can be accessible for people with a wide range of disabilities. Um, so I guess the first thing we should probably talk about is just the visual design of an email like this um, and talk about some of the choices that I made when putting this together. Um, so the biggest, one of the biggest ones when it comes to accessibility is, um, especially for, for people with visual impairments, is to use high contrast elements to make sure that they can clearly see and read um, the content inside of your email. So th this type of email, there's nothing fancy going on. It's a white background with black text. Um, I think that might be, it's probably like a really dark gray as opposed to straight up black. Let me see. Uh, so in the code, I usually set my uh, overall styles on this kind of like container table. So it is straight up black, zero, 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 zero. Um, but super high contrast so that even when like your screen is dimmed, um, if you're in bright sunlight, if you don't have the best eyesight, you're visually impaired to some extent, then you can still read this content. Uh, contrast is not just color either. It's it's the size of your elements uh, in relation to each other. It's the contrast between those elements. Um, so the text is big enough for people to read easily. It's not overly big so that it's hard to kind of drop down into lines or anything like that. Or, you know, it has funky uh, character counts on the lines. Um, it's it's easy to read. That's, that's what we want is something that's usually straightforward easy to read, high contrast, big enough text so that people aren't squinting or pulling out their glasses to read that text. And even in the footer here, this is one area where a lot of emails try to use really, really light text or really, really small text or a combination of the two so that nobody can read the footer of their emails because that's where they usually dump like the disclaimer stuff, um, you know, the unsubscribe buttons, all of that kind of stuff usually lives in the footer of our email. Uh, but again, that's useful information and it's legally required information. So it, you're doing your customers a disservice when you try to hide all that stuff by using really small text or really light text. Um, and there's a whole bunch of guidelines for like what color contrast actually works. If you do like a Google search for color contrast checker, um, there's a bunch of great tools out there. This WebAIM one is one that I use constantly. Uh, where you can plug in your foreground colors, your background colors, and it'll tell you what that contrast ratio is. Um, this web content accessibility guidelines, WCAG, is you'll see it often abbreviated. Uh, again, it has these different like categories of levels of like what kind has of, AAA, AA, like those different tiers of accessibility. Um, so you can see how your content breaks down here and whether or not that's still accessible. So our foreground color was straight up black um, versus the background color. So that's like as high contrast as you can get essentially is that 21 to 1. Uh, so we're good. No worries there. We could check our uh, footer copy here. Um, so that's 888 is the hex value type that in there. Um, so it's a little bit low if we're trying to, uh, since it is like potentially smaller copy, um, if we're trying to hit that double A AA and triple A level, then you can see that it fails here. So that might be one of those things that we need to address in our email design. So if we were to bump that up to, you know, we still want it gray. Um, they have this cool little color picker. We could you know, do whatever that happens to be. And you can see that these checks start passing and failing depending on what that contrast ratio is. Uh, but the thing that doesn't really take into account here is that it doesn't have your actual like font size on there. Um, and it depends on what your organization needs to, like what level you actually need to pass as well. Um, but something to keep in mind, so we can make this, you know, maybe we'll increase the contrast a little bit, still keep it gray. We're passing there at this hex value and we can pop it back in here and you can still see it's like a little bit lighter than the straight up black um but it's still readable which is what we want so maybe we'll save that for our email campaign um from a visual design perspective too another thing like we talk about contrast we talk about font size um i feel like some people might have questions about like what font size should i make my text 
Uh, it kind of depends the really like the baseline that the lowest that I typically go is about 16 pixels, uh, which is kind of like the default for most browsers. Like if you have your text set to 100%, um, or like 1M or 1REM or something like that, then it'll default to 16 pixels. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that iOS devices, if you have text that's 14 pixels or smaller, then it will bump it up to 14 pixels automatically. Um, so that might happen a lot in your footers. So that could affect the design of your email. If you're using like, you know, 10 pixel text down here, it's going to look bigger on those iOS devices because they're trying to make your really small text readable for their users. Uh, so they're kind of essentially doing the work that you should have done in the first place. Um, but I, I, I usually like around like 18, 20 pixels or something is a good like default in my mind. Uh, but again, it kind of depends on your brand guidelines, the overall design of your email, um, the width of your email campaign. If you're using like a wider width container, then you should probably use larger text sizes uh, so that your line lengths don't get too long and make it hard for people to read, um, all that kind of stuff. But beyond like colors and font sizes, uh, one of the main things from a visual design perspective is to keep in mind the overall hierarchy of your email. So hierarchy is all about figuring out what's most important in your email and focusing on that and making that the most prominent and important thing visually in your design so that people can scan through that email as quickly as possible, get to the pieces of content that they need, um, all that good stuff. So there's not that much in this receipt email to create like a super strong hierarchy there's not like headers or anything like that or different kind of article sections that you might see in a typical email newsletter um, but you can see that in my mind at least for a receipt email um, a couple of things would be most important to me as a subscriber one the actual receipt itself which is this table so you can see that from a hierarchy standpoint your eye is drawn to that because it has different styling than the rest of the email uh, with this background color, the bold, dark text, um, this just visual styling sets it apart so your eye is automatically drawn to that. So to me, that's the most important thing, and it's styled as such. Uh, but then also, you might need help uh, with something. So we have this nice high contrast button as well um, to get people to contact them if you need help with your order. Uh, since those are the two things but then the placement is uh, this is kind of secondary to the actual content of the receipt um, so that's where the placement in the hierarchy kind of structure comes from uh, not only is this table styled more significantly and more visibly than the surrounding email um, but it's placed first in the email as opposed to this contact us button uh, which figures into um, you know the overall hierarchy of our email uh, but that's all kind of stuff you can, again, check out that ebook to learn more about. Um, so let's dig into the actual code and point out a couple of things that are important to note, important to note from an accessibility standpoint. Um, so you can see I, I use I'm a big fan of having comments in your emails uh, to understand like what's going on in your code so you can reference it later. Um, but there's a couple of things in here that will absolutely help from an accessibility standpoint uh, when we're coding our emails up top, and then we'll dig into the, like the actual kind of like HTML-y type stuff uh, in the email itself. Um, but one of the biggest things is a lot of people kind of leave off is this language attribute. Um, so this is lang equals en. En is the short code for English. Um, so what this does is it tells tells the computer, tells the email client, tells anybody using assistive technology like screen readers, um, so people that might not be cited, uh, will use something like a screen reader, which we'll check out in a second here, uh, to have that content read out loud to them so that they can understand what's going on in the email or the web page, whatever it happens to be. Uh, so the language attribute is there to trigger different uh, essentially trigger different like voice profiles for those assistive technologies so that the content is properly pronounced, um, read out in like a specific accent or voice profile so that the people speaking those languages can understand it properly. Um, so I'm in America, uh, I'm in Michigan, we, I speak English, um, very, very little Spanish, but it's one of those things I wanna learn a little bit more. Uh, but a lot of times you'll see this language set to English, which means that this the content of this email is set to English. 
Um, but there might be, there's a lot of industries, you know, like financial services, uh, healthcare providers, legal stuff, where they're speaking to different audiences in the same email. So the majority of the content could be in English, but then they have a disclaimer that's also in Spanish. Um, so that's really where that language attribute would come into play is by setting that to Spanish is ES, um, Espanol. And so you would set that language property or that language attribute on whatever that element happens to be. Um, and that can be set on literally any element in HTML I think it's valid on. Uh, so you can tell assistive technology in the computer that this piece of content is in a different language and it needs to be read out accordingly. Um, a kind of quick example of this might be like if you had the word hola uh, somewhere in this email, um, even if you were you know, using it like, like saying, hola, Jason. Um, I forget what the, let's see if I can remember the accent. There we go. Uh, so you have, hola, Jason. So if this is in English, then a screen reader might read out, hola, Jason, which makes no sense whatsoever. Um, but what I could do is make a span, uh, put that copy in there, and then I could set the lang attribute to... Yes. Um, so that when a screen reader reads it out, it can tell that this is in Spanish. I'm supposed to pronounce it hola. Um, so it's it's pronounced correctly. And this is really important for, again, like disclaimers, anywhere you use a different language. Um, just Google for those language codes. There's a whole bunch of them uh, for all the various languages that are spoken today. Um, and kind of use that across whatever elements you need. Um, let's see what else is up here for kind of related accessibility. Um, a good one that's that's kind of related to both accessibility and responsive design is this viewport meta tag um, and setting. You can see here that there's this content attribute and we set that to width is equal to the device width and the initial scale is one. Um, one thing you won't see in here is that there's additional values of um, I think it's like zoom uh, it might be that value if you set it to false. Uh, or maybe zero might be the actual value, then you're essentially like disabling someone's ability to zoom, like pinch to zoom in, um, or to use like browser-based tools to zoom in your email, which is a very inaccessible thing to do. So you shouldn't really see that ever in emails or web pages. Um, so this is kind of that boilerplate that we include in our emails. Um, one thing that is big in the email world are everybody's familiar with those blue links that things like Apple Mail, iOS Mail clients, they will detect things like, uh, you know, phone numbers, dates, addresses, all that kind of stuff to try to make them interactive so people can add them to their phone book, uh, you know, look them up on maps, stuff like that. Um, but it'll make those links blue, underlined, not necessarily on brand. Um, so we do a couple of things in here to uh, kind of disable that um, and just kind of take care of that. But as far as I know, I don't think either of these really like disable the, this might actually disable the functionality of that as opposed to the styling. Um, so that's actually something I want to look into a little bit more to figure out if it disables the functionality here. Um, if it does, then that might be worth actually taking out and just relying on things like these CSS selectors to override the styling of it. Um, but really, from a code standpoint, there's a couple of things that come into play from an accessibility standpoint that are absolutely key to work into your own email campaigns. Um, some of this stuff I've learned from a variety of sources. Uh, this one right here I've learned from Mark Robbins uh, from Salesforce, formerly Rebel, Rebel Mail. Uh, super smart when it comes to accessibility and interactivity and literally anything email related. Um, he and I are actually recording a Trailhead Live session for Salesforce. Uh, that'll be coming out in you know a few weeks if you're a trailhead uh, a trailblazer i guess for salesforce you can check that out in trailhead live um over the course of the summer essentially we'll be releasing i think four videos around accessibility and email definitely worth revisiting uh, but he has this really cool trick to wrap your email content in this div for screen readers so that it's essentially creating it's making your email into an article uh, which is really what it is. It's an article of content that happens to live inside of an inbox. Um, so he's using something called ARIA roles. 
Uh, so this role attribute is something that comes from the aria spec, which I always forget what that... Um, Accessible Rich Internet Applications is what that actually stands for. Uh, so this is something that, this is a W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, a recommendation that's been around for a long time. Um, that's all geared towards making internet applications, or in our case, emails, accessible uh, and rich and like providing additional context for people using assistive technology like screen readers about what the content is in our emails, how it should be interacted with, um, all of that stuff that might matter to them or to anybody really. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of these roles, different roles that will that you can place on different elements to tell the screen reader what how, how should I interact with this or what does this content actually mean. Um, so for our purposes, we're going to wrap all of our content in this article role, which is telling the inbox and the screen reader that this is an article that should be kind of treated as such. Um, it's like a dedicated piece of content that should be read uh, all together. Um, then we can also tell it like what's the description of that article. It's an email. Um, this cool, this one's cool, this ARIA label is something that we can use to when it the screen reader gets to what that article is. Uh, it'll read out like what, like this is essentially like the title of your article. So for us, it's this, your receipt for a recent order with Blobby Blobs. Blobby Blobs is the fake company for this email. Um, so it kind of works similar to the title attribute, um, which is up here, which we could, you know, fill that out. Um, and that's a really good thing to use for all of your emails, maybe bring in the subject line or, you know, I, the monthly newsletter from Litmus, whatever that happens to be, because that'll help people to sift with assistive technology. But then it's nice when people uh, triage their emails and open them up in a tab inside of Chrome or something, which I do constantly. That'll fill out the title in these tabs so you can reference that later. A uh, nice little handy bookmarking kind of thing for people using email. Um, and then you can see we, uh, again, are setting this lang attribute up here to English. Um, and setting this baseline kind of font size to one rem, uh, which we then kind of override down here, but that just gives us that baseline. Uh, but this is really cool. That's it's something I've only recently started doing because I learned about it from Mark recently uh, through his um, goodemailcode.com website, which is kind of his repository of just good email code. Uh, so I pulled it from his template. Um, he has some good information about email accessibility on here, kind of breaks down what each of these pieces does uh, and is a really good resource for anybody trying to learn what good email code should look like. Um, so you can see this wrapping element, um, all that good stuff. So we do that and then the rest of this email is pretty straightforward as far as emails go. Um, it uses HTML semantic elements as much as possible. So that's a big thing, especially for assistive technology, is to use actual semantic elements for what they mean. So the semantics around an element are, it's like, what what does this element mean? What does this content mean? Um, so our paragraphs are wrapped in P tags, which means paragraph. Uh, if we add a heading in here, um, like if we go down to this is still a paragraph, we could maybe replace this with a h2 tag or something like that which is a heading tag we don't really have any major headings here but a newsletter or something like that might have headings more um then we would use those elements because that's what they're intended for uh, a lot of accessibility is essentially just understanding html and css and using it as it's intended as the specs were written because a lot of those elements were written with accessibility in mind. Um, so we run into accessibility issues when you go against that and do what you're not supposed to be doing with HTML and CSS. Um, so our emails at Limus, um, you know, when I code personal emails, anything like that, then it's using semantic elements as much as possible. For the most part, an email, that's going to be the paragraph tags, that's going to be the heading level tags, which is H1 through H6. Um, you'll often see like address tags, um, you can see like block quote tags, site tags, things like that, and it's really just using it as it's intended. Like a block quote is meant to wrap a quote from somebody in your copy, so block it out like that, like actually wrap it in that block tag element. 
Um, but a lot of emails use tables for their overall structure. Uh, while I'm not using tables really for layout purposes outside of this conditional Microsoft ghost table, um, I do use a table down here for the actual receipt content. Uh, and this is actually a good example to show the difference between these two types of tables. So uh, this email is using, it's kind of like the hybrid fluid approach where um, it's using these, uh, you know, this max width property down here to constrain the table width. Uh, but then Outlook doesn't understand the max width property, so we're using this ghost table that only Outlook will see. Uh, only Microsoft will see these conditional comments, and then we have a table, a table row and table cell here that kind of constrains it, wraps it in a 600 pixel wide container. Um, so this table is used purely for layout purposes. Uh, the content within largely is in like tabular data, tabular content. So since that table is purely for layout, purely for presentation, we have another ARIA rule and we set that table to presentation, which is saying that, you know, this, this is only for layout, it's only for presentational purposes, it has no semantic value as a table whatsoever. So don't read that out to people using screen readers or other system technology. Um, and this is one of the best ways to help ensure that your email campaigns are accessible is by including this role equals presentation on any of your tables in an email. And it has to be done on each table element itself. It does in, um, you know, tables don't inherit from the parent element. Um, it doesn't have that kind of cascade in there. So anytime you have a table element, use role equals presentation if it is used for layout. Um, but in contrast to that, we do have this receipt table down here, which is a table of data. It's, it's all this information about the order, what was ordered, how much it was, what the subtotal tax and total were. Um, so since that is tabular data, I don't include that role equals presentation on this table. So when a screen reader gets to it, you, the user will be able to kind of filter through the different columns, read those columns out, um, read it by row, kind of tab through each of these different cells so they can understand that table as a collection of tabular data, which is what it is. Um, so that's one of the best kind of tips that we've been recommending people use is uh, use role equals presentation on layout tables, which is what most emails are built out of. Um, if you have something like this table of data, then don't include that and your emails will be <laughs> so much more accessible just through that one little trick. Um, trying to think what else from a code standpoint is kind of really key for accessibility outside of, you know, using font sizing and colors to create higher contrast, um, you know, using those semantic elements, make sure you close out your tables, stuff like that. Um, so I, I think I might switch over if nobody has any questions about any of that stuff, um, switch over to how to actually like test out your emails for accessibility, because that's kind of half the battle. Um, half the battle is knowing the different like kind of techniques for making your email accessible from a code standpoint. And then the other half is figuring out how to actually test those emails for accessibility, especially when you don't yourself have, um, you know, you're, you're fully sighted, you're fully mobile, um, you don't have any severe cognitive disabilities, uh, you're what would typically be termed an able-bodied person. Um, how do you test this out to experience it as somebody that is dealing with a disability and make sure that your email still works for them. Um, so there are a bunch of tools I'm going to talk about. There's a lot more out there, um, but these are the ones that I've kind of relied on over the years and uh, would be happy to share with you. So the first one is actually built into Litmus uh, in the previews and QA tab here, uh, which used to be called checklists. Now the previews and QA tab. Um, so in Litmus, the typical kind of workflow is, you know, you're, you're building something inside a builder, uh, you do your email previews, make sure it's looking good. Um, you might send it to proof to get feedback on your email campaign from your teammates, from your stakeholders, whoever that happens to be. And then before you actually send your email, you would pop over to the previews and QA tab, uh, to run that kind of last, uh, QA check to make sure that you're not running into issues with like links, which we are, this is just a fake email. I have this hashtag for uh, uh, in Octothorpe, I guess for the link uh, path, which is obviously not a valid link. Um, 
there's no subject line in here it's just the title of the email uh, but within this QA tab, we do have an accessibility checker built into Litmus that does a whole bunch of different checks on your email to try to help you make it more accessible for people, or at least a bubble up content um, or bubble up issues that you might need to address. Uh, I will caution though that some of these um, you might not necessarily need to pay attention to if you kind of know what you're doing. Uh, so you can see there's these three um, different things that came up. Uh, in my email, the first one being your email contains text with a justified or centered alignment. And that's a big thing, uh, especially for like longer bits of text, where if this was all like center aligned, it makes it a lot harder for people to read because your eye is constantly forced to figure out where the next line starts. So people with reading disabilities, cognitive disabilities, find centered text uh, really frustrating to read and we don't want to cause that frustration. Uh, we do have centered text down here with this need healthier order and this little bit of copy down here. Um, but having like, you know, researched accessibility and those kinds of issues, that's one of those ones I could safely ignore my own email because it's only these two lines. Um, it's usually like kind of the rule of thumb is, you know, two to three lines of copy are fine just or centered. Um, anything beyond that should be left aligned if you're in a language that speaks left to right or right aligned if you're in a right to left language, um, depending on, you know, what language happens to be. Um, then you want to keep it left aligned here so that there's that constant, um, you know, line. You can see this is all lined up on the left here. People know it just gives the eye somewhere to go uh, that's consistent so that people can read it more easily. Um, so that one I can ignore. Uh, this your email is missing a meta content type attribute. Um, I could pop this down and see what that looks like. Um, I actually do have that in here. It's kind of like the shorthand uh, inside of there, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, and then this one, we, we do pop up that your email contains tables that are missing roles. So that's that whole thing I just talked about is using role equals presentation on those tables. Um, and I actually identify which line, which table doesn't have that role. Uh, but again, since I'm using tabular data in that receipt email, I can ignore this one safely. Um, we do a couple of different audits to make sure that your images have alternative text on them, which is critical for creating accessible email experiences. Um, in my case, it's just these two logos are the only images in this receipt email. They're purely presentational, so I just have empty alt text tags in there, um, which is perfectly valid, but it's essentially saying like this is presentational, you don't have to read anything about it. Uh, the user doesn't need any additional context around that image to understand the content of the email, so you can ignore it. Um, we set the language type uh, to the language of English. I, our email, the heading hierarchy, which we don't even have any headings in here, is well structured. If we had more content, different sections of this email, then we could use those H1 through H6 tags to um, provide that hierarchy inside of the code of our email, which is useful for screen readers. Um, and this other one, which is kind of interesting, I this shouldn't be right, so I'm clearly doing something wrong. Uh, in this email, which I think we're kind of running low on time, so maybe I could troubleshoot this another time and give an update. Uh, but we do have this screen reader preview in here, which will actually use a service called NVDA. Uh, that is a screen reader tool that's really popular to go through and read your email the same way somebody with a disability, a, a auditory disability will hear that email when they're using a screen reader like NVDA. Um, so I'm kind of curious what's going on here. I need to look into that a little bit more, but other emails will have this transcript that will pull out, which will have all your texts, your links, stuff like that, and allow you to actually listen to what that email sounds like using a typical screen reader service. And that's one of the biggest like things you can do when you're testing email accessibility is actually hear what that transcript sounds like uh, so that you can hear what your users are listening to. And it's it can be a very jarring experience, especially if you're not using those role equals presentation on your tables because it will read out things like, um, this is a table with seven columns and 12 rows per column. Like it'll read each one of those cells out loud, which is a horrible experience for everybody. Um, so that's what we wanna avoid and that's a great way to figure out what your email actually sounds like is by using Litmus's uh, screen reader preview. 
Um, outside of Litmus, though, there are other services out there, other tools that can be really helpful to use. Um, some of my favorites are actually browser extensions, um, which haven't been working in Chrome lately, but they do work inside of Firefox. So I do have Firefox pulled up here with our receipt email. Um, and I'll just walk through a couple of them kind of quickly. The first one is this uh, tool called Tote Ally. Um, so A11Y is... Uh, kind of the code for accessibility, since accessibility is 11 characters long. Um, so, and it's also it spells out allies. So we're all trying to be good allies to people with disabilities. Um, this was created by I think the team at Khan Academy, but it's this little tool. You click the button, you pop up these little glasses, and you can kind of toggle different things in your email. So if we had headings, it would highlight those headings. Um, it would highlight any contrast issues that we happen to have in our email and the colors. Um, it would show, you know, what that link text happens to be, any labels that might be included, um, image alt text, which we don't have, like it literally says that this image is decorative because that image is decorative, um, and like landmarks and stuff, uh, this is an ARIA landmark, this article that we put there. Um, one of my cool favorite things is the screen reader wand. Um, so if you don't have a screen reader installed or you're not like familiar with screen reader services, then you can use something like this and this will kind of give you a preview of like what a typical screen reader would actually read out loud to the user uh, in this little like preview box down here. Um, so that's super helpful to see kind of quickly, very visually like what your email actually looks like or might sound like when it's read out loud to people using screen readers. Um, so that's that Toad Ally one. Uh, super useful. I'm going to refresh the page here. Um, there's a couple of services like Wave, the Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool, um, which they have, you know, browser extensions. They have online tools like that contrast checker, uh, things like that, that'll give you a similar information about the accessibility of your email. Um, so this Wave one, this, this extension, you can pop it open and it automatically like runs kind of an audit of your email. You can click into details and figure out like what those things happily actually are. Like what are those issues? So you can see there's these three contrast errors. Um, I think it probably grades it on that triple A level. Uh, you can see that there's no heading structure, which is fine for this email. Kind of identifies like the alt text stuff. Um, has some information about structural elements, all that good stuff. You can even click in here and get some information about like what those errors actually mean. So for contrast errors, it means that there's very low contrast and um, that could be bad for a number of reasons and here's how to fix it. Um, you can see, you know, there's no structure because there's no heading level um, and even has this built in, the built in little contrast checker in here. It's just like a great tool to get a summary of your email and what it looks like from an accessibility audit standpoint. I'm going to close that out. But one of my favorites is um, this tool called No Coffee. Uh, so this is a vision simulator um, that again works really well in Firefox. It's kind of spotty in Chrome. I don't know if there's anything for Safari out there, but Firefox is a great browser, so worth using. But it allows you to simulate these different visual problems to different like levels so that you can see what your email might actually look like to people with these visual disabilities. Um, so if somebody has low visual acuity, they see blurry content. Um, so you can literally blur the content of your email and see a, if it's still readable or if there's a strong enough hierarchy for people to scan through this even when their vision's blurry. Um, it's a great way to like test things like this out. Uh, contrast law, so again, if people have problems with contrast, then you can see the text of our table. It gets a little bit harder to read. It's not too bad. The button's kind of kind of not great, so we might want to in increase the contrast of the button text against the background. Um, you know, what, what does a glare look like? If, if you're out on a sunny day, then you're going to see, again, it kind of affects the contrast of your uh, elements. If somebody has issues with ghosting, then they're going to start seeing like doubled up text like that. Um, it's just, it's a fascinating way to look at your emails. Um, and I've spent plenty of time kind of playing around with stuff. If people see, you know, that, that noise and stuff that's snowing, um, due to, you know, a disorder in their eyes, then this is what it's going to look like. Um, 
cataracts are a big one, especially since we're thinking about aging populations. You know, people are going to be experiencing cataracts more. Um, my mother-in-law just had cataract surgery to correct hers, but this is a simulation of what people would experience. Um, nystagmus, I think is how you pronounce it, is when people experience like flutter in their vision. So you can see like as we scroll, the content is kind of moving around. Um, and I'm low key suspicious that I have this because I feel like I experience similar issues like this on a regular basis, but I haven't talked to my doctor yet. So maybe I'll have to do that. Um, and then you can test things like different um, color blindness disorders and see how your content actually looks using those. Um, so really, really helpful uh, to check out these different things. Um, I'm going to reset all here and reset the page so the flutter stops. Um, and it even allows you to uh, like look at specific, uh, you know, visual problems like macular degeneration. So that's when the center of your vision tends to be blocked. So you can see what that looks like. Uh, so one of my, this is one of my favorite browser extensions of all time. I think it's so useful for anybody that cares about accessibility uh, from a visual design standpoint, especially. And it's, it's one of those things that I always recommend people use when they're testing their own email campaigns. Um, outside of that, though, there are things like uh, built-in screen reader software that you can kind of get familiar with using. Uh, I'm on a Mac, so it's called VoiceOver on a Mac, which I can actually enable. Um, I think it will play through the live stream here. I go into the system preferences, hit accessibility, go to VoiceOver, enable VoiceOver, and hopefully you can hear VoiceOver trigger here. VoiceOver on Chrome, your receipt from Blobby Blobs. Google Chrome, JSON window, receipt, dark mode greater than litmus tab. You are currently on a tab inside of a group. To select this option, press caps lock space. To exit this group, press caps lock shift up arrow. So you can just hear how somebody using VoiceOver, which is, I think it's the most popular screen reader software in the world. Uh, it's available both on Mac and their iOS devices like iPhone and iPad. Um, lets you interact with this the same way somebody using that technology would because it's the exact same technology. So getting used to using this, I'm not the best voiceover user. It requires using um, a voiceover button, which I have mapped to caps lock here, um, but allows you to go through all this content and see. No notifications available. No announcements available. Hi, Jason. You are currently on a text element. So you can kind of go through your your email, figure out like what. You are currently in a table. To navigate the cells within this table, press caps lock, and then up arrow, down arrow, left arrow, or right arrow. So that's exactly how somebody would interact with the table. So and I can go dollars. through. Order number, A271639, row two of seven. Read that One content. $49.99, row three of seven, 20, row five of seven, $75, row six of seven, seven, row seven of seven, $83.57, end of table. You are currently on, need help with your order? You are currently on a text element. Um, I'm going to close out of it just because I over off. <laughs> just keep reading everything I do on the screen as I'm doing it. Um, but testing out your email with something like VoiceOver, uh, I forget what the one on Windows is called. Android has its own service. Uh, there's lots of popular ones like JAWS, which is a paid commercial product. Um, it gives you a great idea for what people using assistive technology actually experience, and it's well worth testing out your emails. You don't, even if you don't do it on like a regular basis when you're building a new template, Test out the accessibility of your email to make sure that it works, but ideally you are testing at least like through the previews and QA tab and litmus, like each email before you actually send it. Um, but those are my main ones, using some of those browser extensions, using VoiceOver. Um, I know there's different tools online, like Stark is a company, GetStark.co, that builds some tools. Uh, they does some great accessibility audits, um, but all of them are really useful in their own ways to making sure your email is accessible. Um, so we're, we're pretty close here. Uh, it's past lunchtime for me, so I'm getting hungry. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up with just leaving a couple of additional resources for you. Um, this one just got released. It's from Stark, which builds those tools. They're paid tools, um, although I think there are like some free plugins for like Figma and Adobe XD and stuff like that. Uh, but they just released uh, their library of resources for learning more about accessibility, and this is... Far and away, like the best collection of this type that I've seen in a long time, um, and definitely worth digging through 
uh, taking some time out, like, you know, spending a Friday digging through some of the stuff and learning more about accessibility. They have blogs and articles about different accessibility issues. They have uh, different books. Uh, many of these I have in my <laughs> bookshelf behind me here. Um, I think they even have the Ultimate Guide to Email Accessibility from Litmus, which is awesome. A Web for Everyone is one of my favorites. Uh, this one, Inclusive Run and Design from Smash Magazine, is stellar. Um, all of these are really good resources. They have different checklists for when you're building out these different things. Um, you know, communities you could join to learn more about accessibility, uh, information about accessible emails, which let me see there, that's awesome. Newsletters, guides, plugins uh, for your favorite design tools, all that stuff. So a great, great resource for people to check out. Um, I'll pop this in the in the YouTube chat too, if anybody wants to spend a little time, um, check that out. The Microsoft Design Toolkit, the Inclusive Design Toolkit, is really, really useful. It's in the chat as well. Um, I already linked to the Ultimate Guide to Email Accessibility ebook from Litmus. Uh, is a phenomenal uh, resource for people. I have a GitHub repo, which hasn't been updated since last summer, um, but uses most of the techniques that I went over today uh, that is worth looking at. Um, if you do have any issues, then file an issue with it. Um, file a pull request if you want to make some updates and increase the accessibility of these email templates. Uh, that'd be cool. And really, I just want to encourage everybody before we wrap up to um, you know spend some time learning more about accessibility. Uh, creating more accessible emails. Um, I'm going to switch back over to me so you can actually see me. Uh, creating more accessible emails, what's in what's involved from you know copywriting, strategy, visual design perspective, on top of the coding, on top of the development stuff. Um, and just get familiar with those testing tools. Uh, try to learn about what people need that are facing these different disabilities, even if you yourself are not facing them, so that you can build better experiences for all those people. Because um, again, if you're if you're worrying about accessibility for a smaller subset of your subscribers, uh, then all of your subscribers are going to benefit from it. So it's definitely worth the work. Uh, it's definitely worth taking the time, energy, and resources to create more accessible experiences for people. Um, so I'll leave you with that. Thanks for everybody that hopped on. Um, I know a lot of people watch this kind of after the fact, uh, so I appreciate everybody that is taking an hour out of their day to learn more about email accessibility. Uh, again, we do these practical kind of live streams on a regular basis. Every month we're going to be doing even more of them. Um, we started doing, I'm calling it AFIMO is the acronym, but uh, a few me email minutes on uh, a new kind of live stream thing that's super short. It's 15 minutes every other Monday. Um, so we did the first one this week. We're off next week. The following week we'll have another one just kind of on and off uh, at 1230 Eastern time on the Litmus YouTube channel. Join me, join guests that I'll have on there just chatting for 15 minutes about a specific email topic that changes every time we do it, uh, usually related to something that we put out content-wise, something that's been on our mind as a marketing team and email folks over at Litmus. Uh, and just subscribe to the Litmus YouTube channel if you haven't already so that you keep up to date on all of the live streams, all the videos that we post, all that good stuff. If you want to keep up to date on all the Litmus stuff, uh, webinars, YouTube, blogs, ebooks, reports, events, all that stuff, uh, just head over to litmus.com slash subscribe, get subscribed to our newsletter, and you'll get all the updates as we push them out. Uh, so thanks everybody again for joining me. Uh, have a great rest of the day, have a great weekend, and stay safe. Cheers.